Stephanie was mistakenly buried next to her husband in the very spot where she hopes to one day be laid to rest. It was months before Florence heard about the mix-up. Well, who wants her husband or her father buried under someone else's name? It don't make sense. She thought it would be an easy fix. Exhume Mr. Ivany's remains and move him a few feet to the right in plot number 187, his rightful resting place. The funeral home that buried Maurice even agreed to do it for free. But Florence says members of the Ivany family have not been cooperative. But they're saying that they did no wrong. I don't understand. I mean, I went to lawyers. We've had, went to Supreme Court twice. They don't show up. We do, but they don't. Florence says she decided to go public after the Ivany family refused to give permission for an exhumation. I have the paperwork that proves it's my plot. There's also paperwork out there proving that they bought that plot. Members of the committee that manages the cemetery are caught in the middle. While they sympathize with the Ivany family, they say a mistake was made and that Sam Ivany should be moved. As a committee, we're, we're, uh, we're supporting Mrs. Chaffee. So what went wrong? It's obvious that they made a mistake. They didn't go to the right of the, the post and, and dig the grave. It was dug to the left, which was Mr. Chaffee's plot, and it's 10 feet from post to post. Efforts to reach the Ivany family were unsuccessful, and the funeral home that buried Sam Ivany in the wrong plot no longer operates in the area. But a representative of Blunden's funeral home said they did not make a mistake. Lorraine Blunden refused to comment further, saying the matter was before the courts. Meanwhile, Florence Chaffee says she's in limbo. Oh, I want my husband's grave done up. I mean, my husband was a hard worker, and he was an honest man, and the least I can do for him. I don't want them near anyway, but he's dear. I got no choice in that. Terry Roberts, CBC News, Milton, George's Brook. The Premier and Prime Minister sat down today for their first meeting about the Atlantic Accord. The Premier hopes a new deal will help improve the province's fiscal situation. When it was last negotiated in 2015, the Atlantic Accord led to billions more for Newfoundland and Labrador. No hint today on whether they made any progress. This is the beginning of a process to renew the, uh, the Atlantic Accord, which was part of the 2005 agreement that was put in place. So we had a great meeting today and we look forward now to getting our team together. Marble Mountain has had another tumultuous season after extreme weather highs and lows. Today the hill is closed for the season, but yesterday's dump of snow will help riders in annual snowmobile races this Saturday. This year's ski season was plagued with heavy rains and flooding that ruined parts of the hill. That contributed to what staff say was a 20% drop in business this year. But altogether, skiers still had 73 days on the slopes, which, despite this year's difficulty, is close to what they had last year. It, it was a nightmare. I mean, I, I just couldn't believe it. Every morning I, I woke up, we managed to get the hill back operating, 60 mils of rain. Uh, we've had everything thrown at us this year. But it's amazing that we actually made it through the year. I, I'm still amazed over that. Uh, and here we are today standing in a snowstorm again. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's just the, the luck of the draw, you know. Well, as you said, standing in a snowstorm again. Intense weather across much of the province yesterday. On one side of the island, a blizzard smothered the region with heaps of spring snow. And on the other, wicked winds damaged property and pulled down power lines. Here's some of the videos that you've been sharing. It's Christmas time in the city. There's Ridgey over there blowing a bit too. Silver Bill, Silver Bill. It's Christmas time in the city. April the 9th, <laughs> 2018. Just like winter started. 
In other news now, serial rapist Sofiane Bolog, who's been deemed a dangerous offender, is appealing his convictions for the multiple assaults. Four years ago, Bolag was found guilty of raping two women and a 15-year-old girl in St. John's. He's now filed appeals to have his convictions overturned. He gives two grounds. One, there was a conflict with two judges he dealt with in provincial court. And two, he claims the RNC didn't have a warrant when they collected his DNA. Bolag appeared by video this morning and was representing himself at the Court of Appeal in St. John's. The couple the police arrested in connection with the theft of furniture from a condo in St. John's appeared in court. Dominique de Lille and Sarah Deneau have been charged with stealing $30,000 worth of furniture from a condo that they rented in St. John's back in January. De Lille is also charged with forging a lease and using a false name. Police put out their images and Deneau was arrested at a business in St. John's. She was released on bail yesterday. DeLille was arrested yesterday after trying to outrun the police. He's also charged with evading the police and dangerous driving. DeLille has a lengthy criminal record in Quebec. His bail hearing started today and it continues tomorrow. Well, figure skating superstar Caitlin Osmond is homeward bound. The recent world champion and two-time Olympic medalist in South Korea will be busy as she spends a few days in her hometown of Marystown. But that's not the only stop she's making. No, not by any means. Here now is Jeremy Eaton has been trying to keep up with Ms. Osmond's busy schedule and he joins us live from the newsroom. Jeremy, when exactly does Caitlin get home? Well, if the flights are on time at the St. John's International Airport, she's expected to land at 7 p.m. on Thursday. And I've been told that there will be a rock star welcome waiting for her. And she's bringing home the hardware. She has a world championship gold medal, an Olympic gold medal, and an Olympic bronze medal. It's been a remarkable year for the Marystown skater in the female event. She shattered, shattered her personal best, becoming only the sixth woman in Canadian history to win an individual medal in figure skating at the Olympics. Her team also won a gold. But she wasn't done there. In Italy last month, she won a gold medal at the World Championships. That's the first time that's happened since 1973. And her schedule isn't getting any easier. She's heading to Confederation Building Friday morning. Then she makes her way to Marystown, where she will skate with her old club in a sold-out show. Then on Sunday, off to CBS to skate in another show before heading out of town. Now, I spoke with the MHA for her area, Mark Brown, earlier today. Caitlin has proven that no matter if you're from Medicine Hat, Montreal or Marystown, you can compete and win on the world stage. She is an inspiration to countless young boys and girls in all athletic varieties. And what I think is so beautiful about the story of Caitlin Osmond is not only Caitlin herself, but the commitment of her family. They left early in her career to pursue training opportunities, and they have stuck with her every step of the way. And that's a great story that we're so proud of. So people in Marystown will get the chance to see her on the weekend. Now they named a highway after Team Gushu when they won a gold medal. They named the road leading one of the roads leading into Stephenville after Katarina Roxon when she won a gold medal. And I'm hearing that they're most likely going to name a road after Caitlin Osmond as well. Now which one it's going to be? Well, I've been told we have to wait till Friday morning. Reporting live from the newsroom, I'm Jeremy Eaton for Here and Now. And speaking of Friday, mm -hmm. I'm going to have a chat with Caitlin oh, great. Uh, early on Friday morning and then afterwards the Premier and government officials Very nice. will be unveiling whatever oh, is yes. going to be named after her. So we we'll look forward to that. Perhaps a road that will be smooth as ice with no holes in it. That would be nice. <laughs> that would be lovely. Keep it smooth. I want to do something. I'll be the best and I'll get a job at it because that's what I want to do. A very young Rick Mercer predicts his future success. Now, after 15 seasons, the Rick Mercer Report wraps up tonight. Chrissy Holmes interviews him next.
Welcome back. Well, tonight's the night for must-see television on CBC as one of this province's biggest personalities wraps up 15 seasons on one of Canada's most celebrated shows. Yep, with 25 Geminis, 9 honorary degrees, and a country full of friends, Rick Mercer's calling it a day. Well, at least for now. Our Christy Holmes spent time with Mercer in Toronto as he and his crew put together their final show. Look, you look around, if, if you're in show business, this is what you want. You want a set with an audience and the cameras, you want all that. So I would never spend one second of one day complaining. I will say that it is all encompassing and that was okay with me. For 15 years, Rick Mercer has been flat out. Think about it, travel, adventure, handshakes, write, rent, remember, repeat. <laughs> Well, it's a pretty big entourage, as you can see. There's, there's four of us in total. Don Spence, my cameraman there, has shot all of these rants. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of time spent in this alley together. And, and John directs them. And uh, there, there is someone, Matt, who does many other things, but he will take the advance with a shovel. And uh, if there's anything that needs to be removed, like an animal, like a rat or anything like that, he'll shovel that out of the way. We have covered a lot of With 263 of rants fans. down, that's a lot of ground to clear. Someone actually did the math and figured out that the crew has walked over 42 kilometers in Graffiti Alley. And for the crew, that's backwards. There have been rants that have been kind of important to me, like, you know, the, the, the one on teenage bullying and suicide. One of those kids was Jamie Hubley. He was 15, he was depressed, and he happened to be gay. That's not a typical rant because we, generally we try to keep them light and sometimes they're, they can be about something as, as frustrating as the way people don't know how to use escalators. That was one that I heard from people all over the world. They were like, finally, someone said that. I was like, it should be taught in schools, apparently, how to get on an escalator, it's the rules of the road. Getting into a rant has never been Mercer's problem, but finishing the rant is another issue. See that beeping? See, if we were in the middle of a rant now, we would have to say cut because JNS Fresh Meat Wholesale Inc. are going to start unloading goats, as you can see. <laughs> and this guy has just parked his minivan and gone away. And literally, that's a street. Yeah, we're just going to sit here and stare. <laughs> but that's not the only challenge. One thing that you always encounter are fans, and uh, yeah, some fans are, uh, you wouldn't expect. Some, what do you, you mean? Know, people shouting at Rick and, you know, hey, buddy, you're cute, <laughs> and stuff like that. So. This is not true. The words just <laughs> fell from John's mouth when it started. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Nice oh meeting God. you. This morning I said, oh, let's just go just to see Graffiti Alley, and I swear, I said to my husband, just coming down here, I said, all we need is Rick Mercy, see him around. <laughs> So he says he's there. I said, what do you mean? This is crazy. It's so cool. <laughs> That's really cool. I never thought that I even like, never thought I'd live in Toronto, let alone uh, see him in action. That's so cool. Yeah. Him and Jan are, when they were sky, ju sky jumping, is that what it's called? Yeah, no, they were hilarious. Jan's another really comical lady. So yeah, that one was probably my most memorable. That's what I like. He's like in... Red Deer, Alberta, he's here, he's there, he's everywhere. But I just watched his tribute to Gordon Downey and he told the story of his father um, having the phone call with Gordon Downey just like he was any other friend. Just that whole story, kind of, I had a few tears for sure, yeah. The uh, talking to Americans thing and, you know, for people who love to look down on Americans, it was fabulously entertaining. <laughs> and. I, I think the spread the net challenge is really, really meaningful too. When I heard that you were serving Indian food in Canada to buy bed nets for Africa, I thought there's nothing more Canadian than that. Talk to me about the school. We raised $2 million for spread the net. For me personally, there's moments like uh, bungee jumping with Rick Hansen. I'm very proud of the vote mobs we did. Vote mobs were popping up all over the country. Something big, I feel it happening out in my control. The greatest gift has been the ability to travel as much as I have because it's, it's 
the biggest problem Canada faces that we're so big and it's, it's prohibitive for most people to travel. And uh, it's infuriating when, you know, people have a really strong opinion on Quebec and yet they've never been there. Or they have a really strong opinion on Alberta and yet they've never been there. Or Newfoundland, they've never been there. And you know, if, if they could just visit those places and meet people from there and develop a relationship, then that opinion would, would be informed by that and it would be, it would be a much more generous opinion. It's a theme that has consistently appeared in Mercer's work, and it will again tonight in his last rant. It's about uh, getting out and seeing the country. That's what it's about. This is the last show? You're kidding? He's gonna, he's gonna be retired? No, he's gonna do something else, no? We're wondering what he's going to do next. Yeah, he could retire, he could knit socks, he could go to Newfoundland, he could see his mom, dad. That's people great. got a lot of questions, Rick. And you know what? One thing we're finding out, yes. people are not buying that you're done. Or at least they well, don't I'm want not to. Done. Be. I'm not done. I'm not retiring. I don't know where that kind of came from. It's not a word I ever used. And uh, so, yeah, I'm not done. I just don't know what I'm going to do next. They all want to know, though. They keep asking, what's that's he going to do? Well, that's good. I mean, that's what you want, isn't it? It's better than the alternative. People saying, go, go, go away. Yeah. Very nice. I Very can't nice. wait to see what he does next. Yep. And uh, kudos to Chrissy. She talked mm -hmm. him into going into the rant alley, and yeah. it uh, really Had was a very great. busy time. So a great night tonight. Yeah. yeah. Right? That's the uh, one-hour finale of the Rick Mercer Report is on at 8.30 Island Time. Not to be missed. Definitely not. Uh, from, uh, you know, I felt like I was in a bit of a, an alley today with a, a gang of kids around me, uh, <laughs> and they were kindergarten kids, uh, so I had my hands full this morning. Yeah. That's a uh, tough crowd. A very <laughs> tough crowd to keep um, occupied and keep their attention. Uh, but uh, I tried my best and I was over at the, the Rennies River Elementary School today and what a great group they had. Uh, again, all the kindergartens were in there. Oh. And I will say for that age, they did have some pretty good uh, questions about the weather. Good. Uh, the highlight, I think, for them was discovering that there's such thing as a fire tornado, uh, the fire <laughs> whirl. And so we were showing pictures of that. I don't know what teachers did before a smart board. As you can see, the, the smart board behind me. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, you know, typing in uh, images so I could show them. And uh, they were all loving that. So they, thank they you. They really knew how to draw back in the day. <laughs> I guess. It's yes, it's true. <laughs> some, of, some of us, not others. Um, okay. Okay, and one thing we were talking about today was, of course, the weather and uh, beautiful sunshine out there today in St. John's. High of three degrees. Temperatures yeah, were a little on the cool side, but at least the wind, the wind finally backed off today and it wasn't quite as gusty. Uh, sun still shining right now. Here's the uh, uh, shot from just a few minutes ago. Uh, just outside of Port of Basque, temperatures near minus one, sun and cloud, winds Again, a little on the steady side through uh, a good portion of today, but a lot lighter than they were tomorrow, uh, yesterday rather, as that low pulled away. There's our storm that we're going to be watching, and it is a storm, just not a storm for us. A storm for the fish, as we like to say, as it will be sailing uh, just to our south. Enough that it will be bringing in uh, some flurries for some of us, a very light snow for the southern Avalon, but not going to be a big story. This will be the next real weather maker that we have to watch, and that will be in the later stages of Friday and into Saturday. Here's how things are going to play out. Uh, note that those gusts tonight still in that 50, 60 kilometer per hour range continuing to ease off as we roll into the Wednesday time period. There's 6 a.m. and watch the cloud cover will start to build up places like the Buren Peninsula and the Avalon. We're starting near minus 3 to minus 6 tomorrow morning, minus 12 to 16 for inland parts of Labrador. And as we roll throughout the day again, there's that cloud cover really building up into the afternoon is our best chance of seeing some flurries up to a couple of centimeters possible for the southern Avalon. It looks like St. John's maybe enough to uh, to whiten the grass if the system is just a bit further to the north and west. Right now, I'm only expecting a couple of flurries, although, uh, you know, a little shift will make it uh, obviously a pretty big impact there. Uh, over for areas of central and western parts of Newfoundland and Labrador, we're going to be seeing some sunshine. Slight chance of seeing some flurries as that disturbance tracks in, but overall, it's pretty quiet uh, for tomorrow. Winds even lighter, as I said. Now, into the Thursday time period, Cloud cover again, a little on the thick side at times, though I do think we'll see some sunny breaks in the mix. 
Temperatures, uh, again, not all that warm as we have a bit of an onshore flow from the north. So two, three degrees is about all we'll muster temperature wise, even with uh, some of that sunshine in the mix and into the Thursday night, Friday time period. Then we'll really start to see the cloud cover build in. Watch your timeline here. If you do have some travel plans for Friday into the weekend, it looks like it's smooth sailing for the bulk of Friday. Friday evening, afternoon into the evening is where we start to see that snow pushing in to the southwest coast. Corner Brook down towards the Buren Peninsula by the end of the day on Friday. Friday. That snow starting to move into Labrador as well uh, through the day on Friday and the winds picking up as well. And this will again will be a more of a story for the Friday night Saturday time period. Friday itself not looking too bad and we'll have more of your weekend forecast details coming up in just a few minutes. And before we get back to the weather that you'll have in just a few minutes, we saw part one of your series navigating the North Coast yesterday. Now we have part two. That's mm -hmm. right. I got to uh, watch from the luxury of home because I wasn't on the show last night, and it looks like you had an incredible journey. It really was. It was a great visit, and of course, it was myself, producer Jen White, cameraman Bruce Tilly, who was a real trooper <laughs> filming in the minus 40s wind chills, but we had a great time and learned so much about the role that Mother Nature plays. Uh, we also met some great people in Labrador, including Air Borealis Captain Kevin Han, or should I say Ryan Snodden. Have a look. So I understand that you're the unofficial weather forecaster of the pilots. Uh, everybody calls you Ryan, apparently. Is that a true story? <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, I hate well, to put you on the spot. Yeah, but... yeah, kind of. Uh, well, uh, you know, yeah, well, I've been at it for quite a while. So, uh, yeah, a lot of uh, the younger pilots uh, would, uh, would ask me what I would uh, think of the weather. And... Uh, uh, sometimes when I'm watching you, giving your weather forecast on TV, I says, he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that before. <laughs> I'll have to start calling you up more, I guess. Yeah, I yeah. guess so. <laughs> yeah.
Caitlin Osmond is coming home. The 2018 World Figure Skating Champion and Olympic Bronze Medalist will be in Marystown this weekend, and CBC will be there too. On Friday, I'll be live from Marystown capturing all the excitement on the Buren Peninsula, and I'll have a feature interview with Caitlin. Then on Saturday at the Caitlin Osmond Arena, I'm honored to MC the Crystals Figure Skating Club's big show with Caitlin as guest skater, the place where her skating dream took shape. When it comes to flying in Labrador, weather is the all-important factor. And there, of course, are consequences when a flight can't get into a remote community. Not only does it affect passengers, it also means food and cargo aren't making their destinations. In part two of our series, Navigating the North Coast, we take a closer look at the flow of goods in the Big Land. Day two in Labrador, mid-February. A snowy morning in Happy Valley Goose Bay. About a mile and a half of visibility along the runway. But as we prep for our flight to Nain, it's the winds we're watching. The winds can be very uh, unpredictable in Nain and they can uh, get quite strong. Um, yesterday, the main, main winds went to uh, 110 kilometers. Uh, and that can happen very quickly, and it can die out very quickly. The Labrador Coast, you always got to expect the non-expected. Can I just lay myself on? Yeah, yeah. yeah. This twin otter is supposed to carry us to the most northern community on the coast. But more importantly, the food. With more snow and gusty winds on the menu for tonight and into tomorrow, this needs to get to Nain today. We're always looking at least two days out when we see a, a weather system moving in. Uh, it's not uncommon for us to you know, basically call up the wholesalers and say, look, we're going to have bad weather on Tuesday or Thursday. You know, get the food in early, we'll get it moved early. This food has an expiry date. It's traveled all the way from Montreal by ship to St. John's, by truck to Bay Roberts, before hitting the road across the island. Then from the Straits to here in Happy Valley Goose Bay, the last link in the supply chain before going up the coast. So on Tuesdays and Thursdays is basically the big days for items going to the coast. Tuesdays are primarily for moving milk and dairy and vegetables like carrots and turnip. Thursdays, produce like lettuce, broccoli, and spinach. And then those are moved to the coastal communities uh, late Thursday into Friday to be on the store shelves to be sold while people are picking up their groceries for the weekend. These oranges, apples, eggs, and yogurt, all bound for name. Set to hit the shelves of the local grocery store later today. But food isn't the only cargo that heads north. We can go back to an era when there was one flight every couple of days that would get in and that plane would have a bag of mail or two bags of mail for uh, each of the communities. In recent times with you know the internet and the ability to do online shopping which is really trendy around the world but where really you don't have the same access to shopping centers to be able to go into a store so people are doing the online shopping. Whatever an individual would do in downtown Toronto or Calgary or Vancouver in online shopping, it's happening in coastal Labrador. People uh, are looking for the best deal. Big ticket items like bikes and snowblowers, packages from online retailers Walmart, eBay and Amazon, all shipped by plane. But just how much gets put onto an aircraft all depends on the weather. The Twin Otter is loaded, the forecast all clear for flying. Ready to go with our captain and first officer. A one hour and 15 minute flight to name. And we're lucky. The forecast calling for very light winds. Are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready to go. <laughs> yeah, I'm ready to go. Uh, I'm excited. And especially because I've never been to the North Coast, so I'm excited. Down the runway, 
in the air, into the clouds, and off to name. Okay, we're about halfway through the flight. How are conditions looking? Uh, conditions are uh, good. We got the uh, fairly smooth skies here. We're probably going to see some sunshine here very soon. The winds are 340 at uh, 8 knots. Uh, we're looking at a temperature of uh, minus 23 in Nate right now. How will you uh, decide how you're going to land the aircraft? We always try to land uh, into the wind. The wind right now, it's uh, showing to be uh, 90 degrees across the runway. So uh, it, right now, it could still be either runway. Tomorrow, the final installment of Navigating the North Coast and landing in picturesque name. When Henrietta first went missing, the family didn't know for weeks. Now, more than three decades later, the search for Henrietta M Millick continues. As times change, theories do too when it comes to missing people. In the case of Henrietta Millick, there have been many thoughts on where the young Inuk woman may be. Was she murdered or did she simply perish in the winter cold? Because of a new tip in a cold case, the RNC has a new idea of where Henrietta Millick could be. Here's Arianna Kelland with episode six of Last Scene. On a chilly morning, Henrietta Millick tells her friends she plans to visit her infant son, a baby who was taken away from his mother and placed in a foster home 70 kilometers away. But did the young woman with dreams of becoming a nurse ever make it? 
Do you believe that Henrietta Millick was murdered? That's a very tough question to answer. One of few photos of Henrietta Millick. Memories of a once cheery 25-year-old mom of two. Taking classes at university and working two jobs, Henrietta had dreams for the future, a future that was cut short. Henrietta Millick disappeared on December 10th, 1982. And while her case has stumped every investigator over the years, police have pieced together what may have been Henrietta's last day alive. The Key Club, Water Street West, long thought to be the last known location of Henrietta Millick, one that was shrouded in mystery. Inside, a group of unknown men, a bartender, and a crying Henrietta Millick. Two of the men had Henrietta by the arm trying to remove Henrietta from the club. Uh, no witness has ever placed Henrietta being removed from the club uh, by these men, but there were some attempts for these men uh, to remove Henrietta from the club. At some point that night, Henrietta Millick disappeared. She did leave behind one clue, her purse. Inside, keys, some cash and a calendar. And for a long time, the key club was where she was last seen. As word spread of a missing woman, tips came into police. One woman thought Henrietta Millick knocked on her door on Blackhead Road that same night. The unknown woman was looking for her boyfriend who lived in the area. She was last seen walking in the direction of Cape Spear. By 1995, police were certain Henrietta Millick was murdered. So certain, a judge signed off on a search warrant and this property on Blackhead Road was excavated. We had that property for a period of time. There was excavation on, on the property, looking for the remains of Henrietta. Unfortunately, her remains were not recovered. As time went on, the case grew colder. Evidence that may exist went undiscovered. People who may have seen something never came forward. What we have here is a overhead view of the search area. And this is then, kind of more the than 30 years the after the bright-eyed woman vanished, new information. In 2016, a new witness sat down with Inspector Tom Warren. He was pretty satisfied of the night in question based on some activities that him and his friend had ongoing at the time. They picked up a lady matching the description of Henrietta on the trans Canada Highway as she was hitchhiking headed west. The description fit. The story of visiting a family member fit. Those men reportedly dropped off the woman where the trans Canada Highway intersects with Roach's line. The person was very credible. There's no reason whatsoever for me to disbelieve this person. Based on the description that they provided, based on the conversation that they were provided, I was satisfied or had a belief that this person was Henrietta. That information sparked a new search. Dozens went into previously untouched woods in search of Henrietta. I want to acknowledge that. Back in Labrador, Henrietta's family members say they had no idea there was an update in the case. Her story was told at the inquiry into murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls. About the court process. I made several attempts to call the RNC to find out what was going on. No one would answer my questions. One of the RCM, RNC officers even said, I don't know what you're talking about. And if I did, I wouldn't tell you anyway. The attitude didn't change from over 30 years ago when Henrietta first went missing. 
The family didn't know for weeks. Like times before, they had no luck. It haunts Henrietta Millick's son, Chesley. Henrietta's mother passed away recently and never got the answers she desperately sought. So now Warren is left with three possible scenarios. Was she taken from the club? Did something happen to Henrietta in Shea Heights? Or did she perish while en route to see her son? For Warren, that last option seems most plausible. If indeed Henrietta was on Roach's line on that night in question, it is quite possible that uh, you know she could have succumbed to the weather. Welcome back, and that music means time to meet our Young Athlete of the Day, who's from Kellegers. This is 12-year-old Kyle Slade, and he's the national, he's the reigning national bowling champion for the YBC Bantam Boys, and just won his third provincial title. Racking them up, he's the junior boys single champion, and he will represent Newfoundland and Labrador in May when he gets to travel to Regina, where he will compete in the YBC Nationals. We're cheering for you, Kyle. Congratulations on being chosen as today's Young Athlete of the Day. So before we get to the weather, uh, we have a story about heavy snowfall and a moose to tell you about. Yes, have a look at what Tyler Windsor found stuck in the snow. This is when he was out for a, a snowmobile ride. This happened on Saturday, so there he went. And he and a friend in Triton found this animal, the poor thing, it was exhausted trying to fight to free itself from the deep snow. So they rubbed it, uh, they rubbed the fur, tried to give it some comfort, fed it molasses bread, even tried to talk to the moose to soothe it. 
Nothing worked though. It was so exhausted it uh, didn't even walk when it was freed from all that snow. It slipped down an embankment and according to Tyler stayed there. They left about an hour later when it seemed the animal was regaining some strength. Mm -hmm. But the sad news is the next day Tyler was told by another friend that the moose hadn't survived and died where they had left it. Sad indeed, but uh, kudos to those fellows for their compassion and uh, you know, trying to do what's right. Yeah, sad story. For sure. Uh, again, a lot of snow obviously on mm -hmm. the west coast and there's more snow, believe it or not, as we, what's today? April the 10th. Yeah. As we continue into uh, mid-April, we're talking about more snow in the mix for the weekend, especially for the west coast. Have a look at current temperature, or highs today rather, across North America. Well, you know it's spring across North America when you see highs on the map that are anywhere from 36 degrees in Phoenix to minus three in Fort McMurray and everything in between. The, the temperatures really doing battle here across North America uh, over the last uh, couple of weeks and will continue to do so obviously as we move into May. Uh, this system here, this is the one rolling onto the west coast of North America right now. That's going to be the weather player for us as we roll into the weekend time period. We're keeping an eye on a system tracking, as I said, to the south of Newfoundland for tomorrow. Some forecast models have it further offshore. Uh, looks to me like a better chance than not that it does brush the Avalon and the Buren Peninsula with a few flurries. Nothing too significant, maybe a couple centimeters over the south and east. Area of high pressure looking to be in control as we roll into the Thursday time period. That said, I think we'll see the cloud cover dominate at times with some sunny breaks in the mix. Scattered flurry chances through Labrador. Now into Friday, our next system approaches the Maritimes for Friday morning. Friday itself is a pretty quiet day across Newfoundland. Into the afternoon, we're going to start to get into some at least snow chances for Port of Basque into the Corner Brook region and especially western Labrador with some perhaps late day snow into Happy Valley Goose Bay. Long range outlook here, we can see uh, into the evening, Happy Valley Goose Bay into some snow. And it looks like that snow will work in and across the island Friday night and into the Saturday morning time period. So here we are Saturday morning and that snow will then again continue to move from southwest to northeast. Bit of a break into the afternoon, but onshore flurries back on the menu for western parts of Newfoundland. And this system does look set to wind up as we as it moves away on Sunday and another windy pattern setting up for Sunday into Monday with some onshore flurries and uh, just not a very nice looking uh, Sunday in terms of the wind and the, and the flurries in the mix and then high pressure moving back in for the Monday time period. That appears to be how the next seven will play out generally speaking and here are some of the nittier grittier details in terms of temperatures which we should be around five or six degrees this time of year, so we're a little cool for sure, especially into that Sunday, Monday time period with those northerly winds in there. And of course, the snow in the mix for Saturday uh, looks like uh, maybe a bit of a rebound temperature wise mid next week uh, for Labrador. Big story here being uh, pretty quiet and then that snow moving in for Friday for you folks and into the Saturday time period with again a bit of a break as we roll into the early stages of next week. That's your forecast now. We'll keep you posted, Debbie. Thank you, Brian. In Humboldt, Saskatchewan today, students are back in school. Classes were canceled yesterday because of the deadly bus crash over the weekend. And now school officials are helping students return. We recognize that the whole of our country is wrapping its arms around Humboldt. And I think that in and of itself is critical for our, our students and our parents and our community members. So that, that outpouring of support has been vital in terms of beginning the processes, um, albeit very slow, toward healing. Grief counselors are at the schools in Humboldt and they are available as needed for students in the surrounding school districts. Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg was in the hot seat on Capitol Hill today facing a barrage of tough questions about user data and privacy. It's clear now that we didn't do enough to prevent these tools from being used for harm as well. And that goes for fake news, for foreign interference in elections and hate speech, as well as developers and data privacy. We didn't take a broad enough view of our responsibility, and that was a big mistake. And it was my mistake, and I'm sorry. Zuckerberg ditched his trademark uniform of t-shirt and jeans for a suit and tie as he testified in the first of two congressional hearings. 
Lawmakers grill the Facebook founder over how information from 87 million accounts ended up in the hands of data firm Cambridge uh, Analytica. Zuckerberg outlined Thank his commitment to preventing Senator anything Nelson. similar from happening uh, again. He also today, spoke about how Facebook Zuckerberg. plans to protect the privacy of its users going forward. Well, we all know it was a windy day yesterday, wow. and uh, particularly in coastal areas, and this spot was no ex exception. Uh, this is along the south coast of the island, south. and it's in a remote location. Not giving us much. Uh, <laughs> in, in the southeast. Southeast. Okay. We'll ponder that during That's the right. break. Yeah, we don't want to give it away before the break anyway. <laughs> no. All the answers after the break. Welcome back once again. Well, here's something for you. The folks at Guinness World Records have officially recognized the world's oldest man. Mazazo Nonaka is 112. Almost had a collision there. Yes. Uh, he thinks his longevity has to do with the hot springs in his hometown and his love of sweets. Mm -hmm. And he's still about three and a half years away from the title of the oldest man ever. And the overall longevity record is still quite a ways off. And yes, it belongs to a woman. It was a woman from France who lived to be 122. Ten years on him. Oh, that's pretty old. Uh, if I'm 112, I want a bigger cake. <laughs> <laughs> and he loves sweets, he said. Yeah, there he goes. <laughs> All right, that gets him another couple of years. <laughs> Actually, he looks remarkably well. Amazing, eh? Still wow. able to feed himself fabulous. All right, uh, so I've been, ask, I've been away, and I was wondering, Debbie, in my absence, if perhaps you received a letter in the mail, perhaps an invitation to a big wedding that's coming up, <laughs> a royal wedding. The one across the pond. That's the one. I'm looking for my fascinator. <laughs> <laughs> No, but I'm sure a whole lot of other mm. people did. Lots of speculation, of course, about the big wedding, about the guest list of uh, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle next month. And royal correspondents in London are reporting tonight that there'll be no official guests. Oh, so they don't have the uh, stuff shirts. That's right. <laughs> They're keeping it apolitical. <laughs> Means no prime minister, no U.S. president, or former U.S. president Barack Obama and his wife Michelle. 
They had yeah. been tipped as guests. There so. was rumors the Obamas would be there and mm. bring some of the star power that, that couple has, and mm. so apparently not. They said that it's uh, Windsor Castle, isn't mm -hmm. it, getting married in? I think it's a whole lot, uh, the chapel is much smaller, right. so they were allowed to cut the yeah. guest list. You know they what? also save on costs, right? For, <laughs> Money's tight there, I think. Uh, and you invite one, you got to invite That's all. That's right, exactly. Right? So, uh, slippery slope there. Uh, okay, before the break, we talked about our weather picture of the day and remote location on the south coast all the way down to Cape Race. And this from lighthouse keeper Clifford Doran, who uh, snapped this beautiful picture of the waves crashing in there. Top wind gusts at Cape Race yesterday, 113 kilometers per hour. Whoa. But again, some uh, local weather stations recorded gusts over 130 yesterday, so Amazing. it was a windy one. I've never been down to Cape Race. Another place to put on my list of must travel Spectacular wave. To. Yeah. Right. Fantastic photo. That's our program. Welcome back, Thank by the you. way. Yes, we'll see, see you all tomorrow. tomorrow. Good night. <laughs>